This is Into Healing, and I'm your host, Mira Adura. Today's Into Healing guest is David Terry. David is an avid cyclist and the former head of strategy at Wyden & Kennedy, a world-renowned advertising agency. When I learned that David underwent a double lung transplant, I was curious about how such a brilliant, fierce person experienced his healing journey. Before we even began, David was taken aback to the day of his surgery. It was an emotional opening to a very profound conversation. This episode is sponsored by The Healing Order, a clinic that empowers patients with a tailored combination of holistic treatments, herbs, and education to support the body's innate ability to heal. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and follow us for more transformational healing stories. The last time I was prepped like this was surgery, <sighs> surrounded by experts with machines. Does this bring back like PTSD? Not PTSD, more that memory. Mm. The lights are similar too. Yeah, I know. Oh. Mm. I'm here. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. You were an avid athlete at the top of your game professionally. When and how did you realize that something was wrong? In the summer of 2010, I planned with two friends a cycling trip. Uh, to the Italian Alps and I was training in the year before that summer of 2010 um, and I wasn't getting any better mm -hmm. and I was putting the hours in but I was making excuses like um, it's not consistent, I'm older, work is stressful, um, I'm just not in the same shape I used to be in. But I thought, you know, that's just, you know, that's just the nature of being older and being a full-time professional. Um, so I knew, I felt like something was wrong, but um, I made excuses for why I wasn't getting better. And I went on that trip, went to the Alps and the first climb we did which is out of a, the most northern town in Italy called Bormio, um, is one of, if not the most famous, um, cycling climb. Um, it's super important um, historically. It's beautiful, it's iconic. Um, it's called the Paso dello Stelvio. And I set off on the day with my two friends and. And we didn't, we didn't get more than an hour into it before I just couldn't keep up. Mm. And I told them, you have to go ahead. Um, I'll go on my own. And I almost made it to the top, but that experience of going to the top was, it was beyond, it was beyond hard and I was used to hard and difficult as an athlete, in retrospect, it was traumatizing. Mm. And I was hyperventilating the whole time. I, there was no communication between the air that I was breathing and my muscles. And it, that's what it felt like, a lack of communication mm. between oxygen, blood, and muscles. I was blacking out. Um, um, I was weaving in the road because I, um, I was so lightheaded and everything in my body was saying something's wrong, something's wrong. My psychology 
was not kind to myself. Um, I was really beating myself up because I felt that I had been training so hard because I was an athlete, because I had to get through this. And it was, it was trauma, I like, to myself. I didn't recognize it at the time, but I couldn't even make it to the, I almost made it to the peak on one side, but I just couldn't do it. And so I turned around and I came back and I made excuses, not excuses, I just tried to rationalize, okay, why did this happen? And I just decided it was jet lag um, and it was a combination of jet lag and acclimating to the altitude. Um, and we were kind of on a short schedule so that and we had many climbs we wanted to do, but the Stelvio is, that's the one that everyone goes there for. And, um, and so the next day my two friends went off and they rode and I just decided come hell or high water, I was gonna do it. And, I, and knowing how difficult it was gonna be, I just put myself in that framework of, yeah, it's gonna be hard, but you're not gonna stop. And, um, and I went back and it was just as hard. I was having just as much difficulty. Um, but I went up, went over, uh, the peak went down the other side and then came back the other side. And that was just as difficult and traumatizing as well. But by that point, I was more, I just, I wasn't going to pay attention to it. I was just going to do it. And, um, and I did it and it was the hardest thing. Um, physically and emotionally, well, up to that point that I had ever done, um, you know, careful what you wish for, because I had no idea what was coming down the road. Mm. But then I returned to Portland and being in a lower elevation and being on climbs that are not as hard, I was able to ride and it felt okay. Still had those signs of lightheadedness. Still felt like something was wrong, but kind of would could still say to myself, it's like, well, you're just not very good at cycling and you're, you're an old man and, you know, and just that's, that's just who you are. And then I think it was January, 2011, um, I got bird flu mm. or flu. I got flu very badly in the month of January and it took about a month to not feel like I had the flu. And then once I didn't feel like I had the flu, I got back on my bike and I felt even worse than I had felt before. And I started to say, okay, this is not right. I, I've been knocked down and I'm not coming back up. So I went to go see my trainer, um, a man named Russell Cree. He put me on a bike and we were going to do a, a threshold test, a lactic test. And he shut it down before I even got out of the warm up. He said, and he looked at me and he said, you're already, um, whatever the words he used, out of bounds for this test. And I remember him saying, I don't know what's wrong with you, but something's wrong with you. You need to see a doctor. And, and I don't think I even had a primary care physician at that point, but that started um, the process of diagnosing me because I finally, um, after a couple of different doctors, I got referred to pulmonology at OHSU and my first pulmonologist, her name is uh, Stephanie Nonas. We did a walk test, a standard walk test with a, you know, an oximeter. 
And on the walk test, my saturation um, dropped, my oxygen saturation. And um, so that was the first indication to the doctors. It's like, okay, something's not right. Mm. And, and this was all new terminology to me, but basically saying when you exert yourself just walking, the amount of oxygen in your blood drops. And I was like, oh, so when I really exercise? And they said, well, let's, let's do, let's start the diagnostic protocol. And that, that was the beginning and, and um, my next question is actually in your TED talk, you are quoted saying that your illness was undiagnosable, uncertain, unclassifiable, uncategorized, and unknown. And you said, nobody could tell me what it is, what's causing it, or what's going to fix it. Exactly. So I'd love to know more about that. <laughs> Can you explain what the undiagnosis diagnosis is? It's pretty common. It's very common. Um, there's a lot of idiopathic, from what I can tell, in um, interstitial lung disease. Um, even when they finally took my lungs out and they had a chance to look at them in, in deep, they didn't have a specific diagnosis that basically just said, they have a disease and the disease process is fibrotic. And so it has elements of this and that, but you know, they were goners and they were diseased and they were fibrotic. And that was 10 years after they first diagnosed the same thing. And, and the process is pretty interesting. It's like, they're, it's like they, have, they have a method. And, and uh, it starts with uh, blood tests. And they look at a whole range of different things that they know are potentially markers of lung disease. And they look at all of those and, and they have this remarkable word that they use um, to describe when they don't know anything. And that is unremarkable. <laughs> and so the blood tests, all the blood tests came back unremarkable meaning they literally can't make a remark about it at all. Um, so they go to the next test, which I think blood may be um, second, pictures are first. Um, they don't really see anything on pictures, unremarkable. Um, they see something, some like um, ground glass opacity is the word. Um, that may be indicative of inflammation. Inflammation's not good, but in terms of what it may be, unremarkable. Mm -hmm. Blood tests, unremarkable. Next thing they do is a bronchoscopy and they take a bite of, uh, of your lungs. Those bites were unremarkable. <gasps> um, then the next phase is larger bite going in for a, um, you know, a lung biopsy. And I can't remember the name of the doctor who did it, but he asked me if it was okay um, if uh, they could do the lung biopsy with a robot, using a robot. And I'm really game for anything. And I was like, yeah, sure, that sounds cool. <laughs> and, and on the day of the surgery, um, he comes in and, you know, it's like, you know, as surgeons do, well, not all surgeons, but this surgeon came in to reassure me and say, hey, and, and, he, and I remember he says, I just got back from California. I've been working on cadavers there with a robot, everything looks good. And I said, wait a minute, um, have, have you ever done this on a, <laughs> on a person who's not a cadaver? And he says, no, you're the first one. <laughs> I, was, I was like, okay. Um, and and uh, I thought that was funny. But then 
that the results of that, because they had a bigger piece of lung tissue, then gave them a more specific marker. And when they looked at that, um, and it was November, it was the day before Thanksgiving, um, they looked at that and Dr. Nonis, Stephanie, and Stephanie said, um, we see fibrosis in the tissue. And of course, I don't know anything. And I'm like, um, is that bad? And, and she said, it's not good. Um, we don't exactly know what the diagnosis is, but it's, it's not a good thing to see fibrosis. Mm. But before that they did that, of course, I went straight to Google. Yeah. And I was like, uh, lung fibrosis and pulmonary fibrosis. And what pops up is IPF. And IPF is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And, um, and it says from time of diagnosis, patients have three to five years. Mm. And I'm 45 years old. And I have preteens, mm. three of them. And I'm like, holy shit. It's like, really? Um, and you, it gets real and, and you're supposed to get up from the couch and, uh, go brine the turkey, um, or whatever, or brush your teeth and, and it's an out-of-body experience, but it's not. And you don't know how to reconcile it. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. And for me, then you just really lean into, okay, what's happening? What's happening right now with my diagnosis, with my disease, with this news? And you want some sort of certainty, but you don't get it. The only certainty you get is, holy shit, I'm gonna die. And then and for me, I'm like, well, that doesn't make you special because 130 billion people have already done it. So, and it's a weird feeling. It's like it, somehow it makes you feel special. Mm -hmm and I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but it is going to happen to everyone. It's a special thing to be told you're gonna die. Mm. And even though you know it. Mm. But it just it, became more real. It just became real. Yeah. Cause you and, think of death as this thing far yeah, away. It's like, I know it's gonna happen. It's like, no, know, it's, it's like, yeah, it's you kinda, have time. This is the very limited yeah. amount of time. So it's, how did it, how did it feel to face such uncertainty? drive you just like i just want to lean into it um it's inevitable i'm not going to run away from it i don't i never wanted to feel i hate the feeling of running away from something mm -hmm. i i can't stand that feeling and i never want to be that type of person mm -hmm. one thing that I like about myself is I will lean into difficult things. And so my mindset was, well, this might be the most difficult thing you'll ever have to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to lean into this and, and put everything I have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, it's like when, when the diagnosis says, says, um, Fibrosing interstitial pneumonia difficult to classify, and that's signed by Dr. Colby, the foremost lung pathologist on the face of the earth. Um, that's when I said in the TEDx, it was like, you don't know what I have, you don't know how I got it, and you don't know what's going to fix it. 
And I said that to Stephanie and she said, you're right, I know. I said, so what are we gonna do? And she says, this is what we can do. We're gonna do a, a course of high dose corticosteroids, prednisone. And I said, okay, what if that doesn't work? Well, then maybe we can try a course of mycophenolate. And it's like, well, is that gonna do anything? She says, I don't know. What does the data say? Mm, not much. And I was like, well, would you take it if you were me? Probably not. Mm. And, and, you know, and I did the steroids and I puffed up like a balloon and it didn't do anything. Um, and I continued to get worse. And they sent me up to UW to, to meet with them to see whether or not they wanted to evaluate me for transplant. This was 2012. My pulmonary functions tests continued to decline, to go down. I was at the point where they said, if they continue to drop one more, we think we should evaluate you for transplant. At the same time, I was having a conversation with Stephanie where our an honest conversation and I said, you're out of ideas, right? And she says, yeah, this, and this is, this is the nature of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It is aggressive and, uh, it is resistant to any treatment. Oh. And, you know, this is the course. And I was like, okay, thank you, Stephanie. I know you've done, done everything you possibly could. I gotta go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's where um, people like Marnie Beardsley put me in touch with people who went to see Heiner Freuhoff. You know, it's like when, you, when you're at the end of the road and when you're staring at an abyss, you're open to anything. Mm -hmm. And I was open to anything. Um, what role did uh, classical Chinese medicine play in your healing journey? Just kind of how that was different than the Western medicine path. Heiner looked at me after I'd been through unremarkable, 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 unremarkable. You have pulmonary fibrosis. I'm sorry, it's going to kill you. Um, and you'll probably need a lung transplant. Um, um, if you can get one. After all that, and I went to go see him in his hobbit hut in the <laughs> middle of the gorge, he said, he looked at me and he said, I believe you can get better. And no one had said that to me. And I was like, fucking A right, dude. Let's go. And Heiner and I had a wonderfully combative relationship. I mean, I, I was like, I challenged him on everything. And, um, cause it was weird for me. And so I went full hog into it, everything. I drank the grand granules twice a day. Um, I did, um, I remember the hardest thing he had me, he had me eat three tablespoons of chopped raw garlic. I was like that, that was a lot. And garlic's pretty good for you. Yeah. <laughs> I felt it. Um, and, uh, you know, acupuncture, everything. And I, and and I wasn't, I was entirely, utterly receptive to it. And I started with him when I, when I was a month away from a test that would have started me on a um, evaluation for a lung transplant. And miracles of all miracles, my PFT numbers came up. And Stephanie said, the pulmonologist at OHSU said. This is just in a month. I think it was about three months. Oh, okay. But she said, this doesn't happen. So it was like, I'm going down, I'm going down. 
And usually you bottom out, you don't bottom out and come back up. Life's got goosebumps. And at one point I was in the 37th percentile of lung functions, maybe even 28 at some point, low, I was bad. And I was doing lung functions tests every month. So I didn't completely give up on OHSU and I needed to know, I needed the data. And that was one of the ways I was holding Heiner accountable. Mm -hmm. It was like, if this, you know, it's like, I don't know if I this is gonna work. this works. Yeah, I wanna see if this works and we're gonna, and I'm gonna do lung, I have to do lung, lung functions. And, and it rose 10 points, came up to 45. Then it came up um, a month or two later to 56. Oh. And then it came up to 70. And at one point, it came up to 85, which in the margin of error means you have normal lung function. Wow. And I still on a bicycle couldn't go up a hill. I would desat. So it was still there, but at rest, wow. I had normal lung function. Oh. So I could work, so I could walk. I had to fly with oxygen, so altitude was a problem for me. But, and, and I just, you've learned to accept, well, this is me now, and if this is me now, uh, I'll be okay with that. Cause not long ago I was told that I have pulmonary fibrosis of unknown cause and people don't live more than three or five years, but this is pretty good. And this never happens. And I stayed up there in the 70 to low 80 percentile, which is mild lung disease for a few years. Wow. And you just kept at it. Kept and I kept, it. and I was, and I kept up with Chinese medicine. And I don't know if it's the medicine. I don't know if it's a placebo. I don't know if it's the mental and emotional confidence and belief that I can get better and someone looking at me and saying I can get better mm -hmm. and giving me something that's mysterious and me looking at it and saying this is going to make me better. Mm -hmm. I have no idea if any of that, and I don't have a judgment about it, but that period in, in my life, I did, and Western doctors said, this never happens. Mm -hmm. um, but it did, and I have the evidence to prove, I have the lung function test to prove that it did happen. Oh. And, um, did you tell your Western medicine? Oh yeah, she, well, Stephanie came to my <sighs> TED talk she was there. So she knew all about it. And I, and what and was her reaction? Like, look, she's, they're very smart and they know that they're for the most part, she was, I met some real assholes who were arrogant. And, and, and basically I was like, I could get in to see any doctor in the world because, um, I had a disease that was undiagnosable and their egos are such that it's like, well, I can tell you what you have, you know? And so, and I saw them all. Wow. I saw like, and I consulted with the, all of the who's who's. So of, did they all know that you had done this Chinese medicine? No, only Stephanie did. Oh, this okay. was, and, and she was, I'm happy for you. And I can't explain it. And that's fantastic. I mean, she was, you know, she was nothing but happy for me. So they don't, they don't get curious about like no, figuring out. Cause there's no data about it. There's no studies. There's no journal. It's not peer reviewed. It doesn't, it doesn't have a large data set. It's hard to make a judgment about it. It's anecdotal. It is. And it's like, it's like for it to be taken serious, there's got to be data. There has to be studies. There has to be a methodology no money behind and there's yeah. no money behind that. So it's not going to be done. So it's going to work for some and it's not going to work for others. And also, you know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe yeah. it does work for others. That's the thing. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. 
If I had gone in there with no belief whatsoever, would that have countered it? I don't know. Mm. Was that a huge part of it that I needed someone to tell me that I was gonna get better? And I needed something to do that had intense intentionality to it? I don't know. Mm. You know, it's interesting. A lot of uh, people I've studied with have said, your cells are listening. Right, your cells are listening to everything that you that's going on in your in your mind, and I'm sure that's definitely that has an influence. <laughs> Were Western medicine and Eastern medicine protocols ever in conflict, and if so, how did you choose which protocol to follow? They could have been, but I made them sympathetic. Hmm. You know that was, um, listen, yeah, at one point they were, and I'll tell you where they are. Post transplant, hmm. I was like, I was like, I. I take a lot of drugs right now, and um, and there's enough not enough data to know what the contraindications are between all the drugs, um, the all the herbs, mm. and the drugs, and and I'm not willing to take that chance. So what did you decide to do? I, I don't do Chinese medicine anymore. Oh, interesting. How long did your illness last from the moment that you basically felt something to basically your double lung transplant? How, how long was that? That years? is a, that is a good question because I started, if I started feeling this sort of weakness, this lack of communication between my breathing, my blood and my muscles as early as 1994. Oh, wow. So I think I was slowly deteriorating. Interesting. And when I really exerted myself, it would reveal itself, but at lower mm -hmm. um, and lower ranges of exertion, it didn't really. Um, and, you know, and it was easy to say, it's like, well, you're just out of shape or you're fat or, you know, you're, um, you know, you're not consistent or whatever. So I would say from midnight, I've been dealing with this from the mid nineties wow. until 2020. 2020. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. Can you remember the exact moment you learned that you needed a double lung transplant to survive? And can you descri describe that exact moment? The summer of 2018, I crashed in a motorcycle race at um, mm. PIR. I started riding motorcycles and racing motorcycles because I love two wheels and I love going fast. And you don't need healthy lungs to race a motorcycle. <laughs> um, when you give it gas and want to go fast, you don't desat. So, um, and I started racing motorcycles. And my wife was like, well, he's going to die anyway. So, you know, um, you know, it's like I might as well allow him to do this. And, um, it was, I wasn't actually in the race, I was in the warm up, but I crashed and I broke my foot. And uh, so that put the end Just of my- Just to add more things on your- <laughs> Yes. So that was the end of my race season. And, and when I was convalescing, healing in my basement, I got the feeling, um, I'm dying. I could feel the dying. Oh. And I don't know what else to call it, but I, but it's, I call it the dying. How did that feel like? Dark, sad, um, inevitable, mm. um, coming. It's just, it's, um, it's a terrible feeling. Mm and I could feel it. And then when I'd walk upstairs, I mean, I had a broken foot, so I was exerting myself a bit more, but when I'd go upstairs from the basement, two flights, I could feel myself get out of breath more than what I was used to. And I was like, hmm, that's weird. Then as I could use my foot more, I'd come upstairs and like, I've, I feel a little out of breath. So I got out my trusty oximeter and put that on my finger. And I didn't tell my wife or anything. 
And uh, and I'd walk upstairs and I'd look at my number and I'd go, oh, shit. Mm. You know, it wasn't normal. It had dropped. And I remember I said to this, you know, summer of 2018, I said to my wife, I think my lung disease is back. Mm. I said, I, I want to go see pulmonologist at OHSU and do a lung functions test. And I hadn't done one for probably Since two like, years or something like that. Cause basically they said, you seem to be stable. And, and she said, all right. Were you still on Chinese herbs at that point or no? no. You got off. I was vaguely on them. I was on and off. Yeah, I was on and off. I was still on them. Mm. I was, I was still seeing Einer. Um, but it felt like maintenance. Mm. It was more maintenance. And I knew, I mean, the numbers said that I was worth my own perceptions of myself as saying I was worse. And I had this feeling, oh, you're dying. And, um, and I went, did a lung functions test at OHSU. And, um, I had significantly dropped mm -hmm. in lung functions. And I was like, told you. And she said, well, I want to see you in another month. This is Stephanie? Yeah, no, this was a new doctor. Oh. And she says, I want to see you in a month. I want to do another test and we'll see if it drops again. And it dropped again, oh. a statistically significant amount. I had to tell my kids that my lung disease was back. This was before I was put on the transplant list. I mean, I told them immediately. They were in high school at the time. I told each one of them separately. I told each one of them in my truck. They were in the passenger seat of my truck. And I picked them up from whatever activity they were doing. They get in the car and I have them locked in and they're on their phones. And do 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 do. And I was like, hey, I just got something to tell you. It's like, what? Um, my lung disease is uh, back. And um, uh, we're on top of it. And, you know, they stop and they're listening to me. And I can see them just looking straight ahead. And I'm, and I'm saying, my lung disease is back. Um, we're on top of it. Um, we're gonna get some answers and, um, and we're gonna go from there. And each one of them said to me, um, yeah, but you're gonna be all right, right, Dad? And of course I said to them, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be all right. Um, but in my head, in my gut, it was liar. I was like, you don't believe that. And, and that is when, um, I decided that what I had to do, that my mission was I had to believe that everything was gonna be all right, no matter what. That was my mission. Cause this will probably kill me and I'm gonna die and it's gonna be sad. And I have to get myself in a place where I believe everything is gonna be all right, no matter what. There are easy parts to that process a living will, I mean, you know, a will, an estate, sitting down with lawyers, answering questions, finances, making sure, you know, college is taken care of. It's like just really basic things. Um, my wife's taken care of. It's just like making sure that's fine. The house is paid off, that kind of stuff. But th that's nuts and bolts stuff. The other part is this thing I, love called life is going to end. And like I said before, everyone's going to face this. It's just, 
It's like the other time. Yeah, and or or you don't see it coming, but I saw it coming. And so that's when I said, I'm gonna be open to everything, read everything. My children suffered through it. It's difficult for a teenage, for a teenager to, they don't know where to put their attention. And they soldiered through it, but it left a mark on them in their teenage years. Um, my wife, um, Let's just say no one know, has any idea how strong they are. And she's stronger than any force that I know. Um, when they told me that I needed a lung transplant, that I needed to be on the list, that I needed to be evaluated, um, all of that happens very fast and there's things to do like um, a, uh, a procedure in which they stick a camera through your vein and come up and take a look at your heart. Uh, can't remember what that's called at the time, but just everything, and it's like a game to me. That was easy to do because I just showed up for appointments and um, I would kid with the nurses. I would ask if I could I do this without anesthesia, and um, and they would say if you want to. But that's all to say when you get when they call you and they say you you're going to be on the list, you're approved. It is confirmation that you are dying and you're going to die without a lung transplant, and it's the only thing that's gonna save your life. And then it stops being a game. And it stops being appointments. It, it's, fuck. But the one thing that put a smile on my face in the face of all this that made me go, I think everything's gonna be all right, no matter what, was, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a short book called um, something like um, the uni the How uni insignificant we are. What? <laughs> How insignificant we are in the what? universe. Well, it's, 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 he explains the universe in a short, short book, and I'm trying. I can't remember the name of the book. And, but I, um, the first sentence in that book, and I'm paraphrasing it. But basically, he says, it's a scientific telling of the beginning of the universe. Um, it, it says, all of the light, all of the mass, all of the energy, everything that is in the universe, as far as it goes, forwards and backwards, was once contained in the volume of a space, one to the 27th millionth of the period at the end of this sentence. And, and I went, holy shit. I mean, all this is math. And, and then, you know, then he says, and then there was a bang. And then he explains this like in the milliseconds that happened, the nanoseconds of what happened after that, and it keep expanding. And in that moment, you know, and, he's, and he talks about, what, you know, everything that's in the universe, all these molecules, all of these atoms, were once you, me, everything. These flowers, this water, it's just like this light was all together. In that little thing, tiny little spot. And I was like, oh, so you're saying I'm one with the universe. I was like, all right, I got that going for me. And, and then I started imagining just and feeling all of my molecules being part of all of this for hundreds of billions of light years extending 
it's, I'm not separate from it. You're not separate from it. Nothing is separate from it. It's just all together. And when I die, it's not like I go in anywhere or anything. It's just, I'm already in it. It's just a different state. Mm. And I was like, cool. I got this. <laughs> I got this. Cool. Um, cool. Yeah, powerful. And powerful. that's how I dealt with it. Powerful realization. Yeah. Can I ask you what February 14, 2020 means to you? It is simultaneously the worst day of my donor's family's life. I know a bit about him, but that family had the worst day of their life. And I had the best day of my life. And I have both of those inside me. And I feel that with every breath I take. And I don't know what beyond grateful is, but I feel that. I feel absolutely heartbroken for him. And I feel an overwhelming gift of love from him, from the universe. That's what, it, that's what it means to me. Can you share with us just kind of going into surgery for your double lung transplant and then coming out how that experience was? Being in the bed, it's like, okay, they're ready for you, David. And I was like, okay. I'm, and the only time I remember feeling like that, it, when I was in kindergarten and my mom sent me out of the car to a classroom I'd never been in before. And I was like, oh, she says, just go in that door. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, mommy. And, and I felt like oh, a child. And I also felt like uh, Sean Penn and Dead Man Walking. It's like, time to go in that room. And, and I don't know why I said to my wife, this is gonna be fun, um, but I did. And I went in, the table was cold as hell. And, and then they laid me back and, and the nurses were as nice as, and maternal and as they could be and and they put me to sleep. And it's just acceptance. It's like, I gotta do this. I'm doing this, I gotta do this. I gotta do this. I gotta do this. When, they, when I woke back up in the ICU, I, I couldn't talk and I couldn't see, but I could hear. And my wife told me, She, t she told me that I have new lungs. Because you're told, because you, that's the first question you have when you wake up. It's like, did they do it? And, but you can't speak, so they tell you. And my wife told me. And, and then they put me back to sleep. They woke me up for some reason to check things, and then they put me back to sleep. And they did that two or three more times, wake me up and put me back to sleep. And I think it was the day after. You can be on a breathing tube for a month, or for, I mean for like a week afterwards, but I was progressing quickly. And then they took the tube out, I think 24 hours later. And, um, and they sit you up and, and they 
you put a, can, uh, a, no, a nasal, uh, nasal cannula on you to help you breathe. And um, they start talking to you. And, and it wasn't until that night when I, real, when I was by myself and enough of the drugs wore off where I was, oh my God, what's happened? Oh, and the other thing I did, <laughs> the other thing I did, the moment I woke up, the moment they woke me up, I started moving my feet like this. And my wife didn't know what I was doing, and they didn't know what I was doing with my feet. Cycling. I was cycling. Yeah. I was like, I was like, in my head, I woke up, and then she told me, and I was like, I'm going to go ride a fucking bike. That's what I'm going to do. That night after they took the breathing tube out and I woke in the, in the middle of the night. That's when I felt the overwhelming grief for my donor and his family. And, and I could feel his presence, not in a ghostly sense, but in the physical sense, I could feel him. He's like, these are his lungs. Um, that he needed to be alive. And I could feel that. I could, I was just broken over that. And at the same time, I felt that overwhelming love. Thank you. So um, I'm struck by the fact that when you were ill, you were working a demanding job. And now after your double lung transplant, you can take a breath literally and metaphysically. And so you're taking time off work to rest. Why does rest feel so important right now? What's happened, you, come, you use the word rest, what's happened is the reason why I was good at advertising is because I hated it. And I hated every second of it. I hated brands. I hated clients. I hated marketing departments. It's a whole I, other topic I, that we could talk I, about. I, I hated the bullshit of it. And I knew how to perform. And I knew how to write. And I knew how to think. And I knew how to be persuasive. So I was good at it. And I could take the energy of hate and I could direct it. I could direct it to be persuasive. I could direct it to be intimidating. I could direct it to be convincing. And I was really good at channeling hate and anger and cynicism and all of that and everything. But when I woke from transplant and I felt this, just exceptional gratitude and love from the universe. That pool of hate and bitterness and cynicism and negativity was gone. It doesn't even exist anymore. It's just, it's not there. It's so, I, I can't go back to advertising because I don't think I'd be good at it. And I can't, there's no love for it. And, and I, I have no way to, f I can't do it. Um, it's just not there. And I know everyone says this who has near death experiences, but it's true. It's like in that moment, in the middle of the night, being so close to the surgery that just happened to me and having such a fresh set of lungs in me, there was just one message. It just was coming loud and clear to me. And it was, it was just simply, you are loved. And it was, I was like, holy fucking shit. I can't stand this. It was like so overwhelming. 
And in that moment, I feel like I got a peek behind the veil. And, and I don't want to walk away from it. I don't want to cover it up. I can't, and I, cause I can't. It's, and so I'm, it's not that I'm at rest. It's that I don't know what to do with this. And, and I'm not going to give it to advertising and I couldn't, I can't. So I'm in the middle of figuring out what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do with this? That's where I'm at. In your TED talk before your lung transplant, you said your disease made you feel small, lonely, and overwhelmed. Do you still feel the same way after your double, double lung transplant? Yeah, my disease did make me feel small, lonely, and overwhelmed. But now, no. I just have so much love for life. From a perspective of somebody who has spent a long time as a patient, what does honoring your body mean to you? For me, it means honoring my donor. I know you wrote a letter to your donor. I wrote two. Oh, you wrote two. Would you mind telling us a little bit of what, like what you, what you told them? I told them I am so sorry for your immeasurable loss. Um, I told them that I loved him. I didn't even know if it was a him at the time. And I loved them and and that was the main message. And then last, last August, I went, I went back to the Stelvio um, with one of the two people I went with before. And not only did I go to the Stelvio, I went to all the iconic climbs of the Tour de France and other ones on the Giro. And it was a 10-day trip. 125 miles a day, 10,000 feet of elevation gain. It was brutal. It was hard, but not one ride was traumatic like it was before. They were just really long bike rides. And I wrote a letter to my donor family to tell them what we, um, what me and him are doing. I've learned the donor family has all of the rights in terms of communication. You can write to them. I don't know their address. It goes through an organization. They can choose whether or not they even want to receive it. I do know that they have chosen to receive the letters. And, and I do know that my donor was 23. So the loss that that family feels, and I was saying this before, I feel that with every breath, but it doesn't bring me down because it's also, the most extraordinary gift of love that I've ever received in my life. And that's what I tell them. That's exactly what I tell them. And that's what I told them in the first letter and that's what I told them in the second letter is that I feel your loss and I'm sorry. And I feel his love every single breath I take So my question right now is, what do I do with that? For me, that's where I'm at right now. What do I do with that? 
It's almost three years later and the emotion of this just has not changed for me. What does love feel in your body right now or after this whole experience? All the energy in the universe. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed this conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. You can connect with Into Healing on TikTok and Instagram for more inspirational and behind-the-scenes content, and visit our website, intohealing.com, for transcripts and other goodies. Into Healing is made possible thanks to people like you. Contributions made through Venmo at Into Healing or through our website, intohealing.com, help us bring you more inspiring episodes. This has been Into Healing with Mira Adura. Thank you for joining us.